Premier Media's Polity, Amblum Gilen Gomfe. Joining me today is renowned author Femi Kayode, here to discuss his latest novel, Gaslight. So Femi, can you tell us why you decided to write the book and also discuss the significance of the book's title? I decided to write the book because I've always been fascinated about the idea of large groups of people being given a false reality, almost like being manipulated, and the extent to which such manipulation can actually be detrimental to the larger society. Um, and I used organized religion as a metaphor. It's not an indictment on organized religion, but it's rather a, a cautionary tale to say, that let's just be a bit careful about the danger of relinquishing our individual agency to, you know, some demigod. Because the danger is that that demigod starts to believe that he is actually, or she is, a demigod. And it could be anything. It could be a movie star, you know, it could be, you know, it could be a talk show host, you know, that tells you what to eat in the morning and, you know, what, how to raise your children, you know, without having children of their own kind of thing. Um, so there's a tendency for us as human beings, you know, almost to relinquish that when it almost seems as if we are conditioned to follow and not actually break through out of the mold. And there's no better space to show that than religion. And why gaslight? The title itself is really just about that because that's what gaslight really is. Is gaslighting a, a person or gaslighting a group of people is really just about changing one reality for another and trying to convince that other person or that other group of people that the reality, the grounded mortar and stone reality that you're experiencing is not actually not the real thing. And so uh, I was very fascinated about it and, and I s did studies, you know, looking at Nazi Germany, for instance, and looking look, look at, you know, at um, you know, South African apartheid system all based on gaslighting, <laughs> when you think about it, isn't it? You know, when you tell a group of people that you're inferior to the other, you know, uh, or that you're not the same as other, you're not human, it's not the same blood that actually goes through your veins, then that's gaslighting. Yeah, that's where the title came from, and that's why, that, those are the themes that run through the book as a story. In the book, we are introduced to Dr. Philip Taiwo, an investigative psychologist tasked with clearing the name of a Nigerian Pentecostal pastor, Bishop Jeremiah Dawodu, mm -hmm. who has been arrested and charged with murdering his wife, Fulisade. Can you discuss the relationships between these characters? The relationships are very complex and they're deliberately so. Um, it's a large church. The pastor is a suspect in the disappearance of his wife and police suspect foul play. And uh, I think for me, I don't look at it as the interaction of characters. I look at it as the interaction of systems, you know, uh, the interrelationship of the legal system with the educational system, for instance, you know, with the family system, for instance, you know, and all that. And those are the issues I sort of almost like symbolize by using characters, but they represent something in the system. You know, so Gaslight is not a story that is just looking at, you know, the mega church is looking at those relationships and what facilitates that relationship, what enables those relationships. And if there's a crime that's been committed, what made it possible? And what would make it possible for it to be, to be solved? So I like stories that give context, you know, um, that allow us to be able to see people in their real space and you throw the crime in and then that allows them to actually just you know, act their natural self in that uh, unique conditions. And what it does is that it allows people to have a, a greater sense of understanding of why people do what they do. So the characters are tools, <laughs> you know, so to speak. They're tools of actually examining the varying levels of system, our political system, our environmental system, our social system, the social structures. For instance, in the book, one of the things that I try to explore is how the social systems looks at mental illness in the Nigerian society. You know, how do, do, are we prepared? How do we talk about it? And I remember there was a phrase that one of the characters used and said, you know, it is, it's amusement, it's entertainment to watch a mad man. 
when it's not your child. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that tells you an idea, gives you an idea of how we socially view mental illness and why we have to look at it again, you know. Um, or the idea that uh, uh, a woman that is um, in, a, in, a, in a violent relationship, you know, finds it difficult to go back home to say, this is what I'm going through because now you're married, go deal with your home, you know. Those are social constructs that you use characters to, to, you know, to bring up and then you want to ask to say, is this right? Can we just look at it as a society and see whether we can fix it? You know, so I don't look at it from a character point of view, but rather from a system interaction point of view. Sticking to the character, what sort of obstacles does Dr. Taiwo encounter in his pursuit of the truth? One of the challenges that he would go through, for instance, is the law enforcement system, the procedure you know, of, of solving a crime in Nigeria, uh, I, I, it was, it's very fascinating to me. And I actually think it happens in South Africa to a certain extent too, whereby, you know, we, we arrest somebody, for instance, for a crime, and then we put them on camera. They've not even asked for bail. They've not been charged. We just catch them and then we sit them down and then they actually start confessing, <laughs> you know, in the, in the press conference, and then the police goes, see, we caught the thief, we caught them, we caught them. You know, what happens to innocent or to proven guilty, you know? So there are some things that he, he goes through that are actually very, very systemic, the challenges that he has to go through. So the law enforcement, for instance, again, like I said, the social structure, you know, that says, you know, we don't speak ill of the dead, for instance. Those are, those are some things that, you know, this impede what you can call a modern investigation in, in, in Africa. You know, those those hard held point of views, cultural issues that make it very difficult for you to penetrate and get to the truth. The attitude towards mental illness, a patriarchal culture that believes that the man is always right, you know, uh, you know things like that. Um, yes. So I, I, I wouldn't say he went through things like guns, violence, things like that. That's not it. But he would be going through the systemic challenges in the environment that makes it difficult for him to come to a resolution quicker. And what I've always liked about the feedback I've gotten from Western countries or Western readers is always that this would never happen in London or this would never happen in uh, New Zealand and I'm like yes because it is an authentically Nigerian story that uses the Nigerian context to tell the story you know if this kind of thing happened in Sweden it would be a different process entirely and he would face very different challenges can you detail the internal dynamics within Dr. Tao's family what are the circumstances that lead them to move back to Nigeria from the US and do they adjust well? First of all, my hero or my investigator, Dr. Philip Taiwo, is a very unique hero because he's a very, very strong family man. He's not an anti-hero. He really is a positive role model and he was deliberately designed so. He has um, three children, uh, twin boys, identical, and he has um, all teenagers and then he has a, a, a a young teenage daughter that he's very close to but he's going through some challenges in school uh, in terms of bullying um, and then his wife is a lawyer uh, she's a professor of law at the University of Lagos and they came back from the US ostensibly because uh, the wife has, is, she's on sabbatical and she's doing a study sabbatical at the University of Lagos. But the real reason was because um, the wife wanted them to leave the United States before her children start to think of themselves as a color um, and start to define themselves as on the basis of their race rather than their personality and their, you know, capabilities and ab abilities. And that's the real reason why they left the U.S. Um, Philip is a very reluctant returnee. Uh, and keeps looking forward to the time when they're going to go back to the U.S. and everything will make sense, <laughs> finally. Um, but I like that conflict within the family in terms of how they are adapting to Nigeria because it allows you to be able to play with you know, the current contemporary issues in contemporary Nigeria and, um, and the inventive ways in which you know, we, we can evolve you know, um, 
I think some of the solutions that the wife came up with in terms of you know the bullying of their daughter and he speaks to the African context of it takes a village to raise a child and you know, she stepped up to the responsibility you know but it's th there are things that we just forget that is already inside us because we are now in Johannesburg you know we are now in the city you know we have to come up with more modern ways of dealing with things when actually some things are just common sense <laughs> you know uh, yeah the book alludes to the difficulty that's associated with challenging authority within a big uh, mega church mm. why is it so difficult to challenge authority i think people are built to follow i think the world has gotten more and more complex that in places where we are able to just say just tell me what to do and i will do it you know i i remember when i was growing up the worst thing that you can say to my mom is if you say, if she asks you what would you like to have for dinner and you say anything you know she just goes ballistic <laughs> you know it's been such a tough day <laughs> you know she's made many different choices in, in her day that the last thing she wants to worry about right now is what anything means, <laughs> you know, to you. And, and I just use that as a, the most fundamental example of why people seem to surrender their agency in big issues, you know. But maybe at home, they don't necessarily do that with their children, with their parents and things like that. But in terms of big issues that seem complex and things like that, I I, I, I tend to see that a lot of people like to just take that simple path and say, this one said, go this way, so let's go this way. Very few people in politics, in, in, at work, and all that, ever sit down and say, mm, is that really something that I would want to do? Is that, does that align with my values? Does, is that something that, it's, it's just, it's something that the psychologists or the social psychologists, we don't know, the peer, pressure you know the group effect you know where we're doing it because everybody is doing it so it must make sense because people would not necessarily you know deliberately self-consciously take the wrong path mm. but now we know <laughs> that people do take the wrong path people do make wrong decisions as a group the problem with making wrong decisions as a group is that when we do realize that we've made a wrong decision there's also something about the group that forces us to pretend that we did not. So we dig in. And so we see it in our political parties, especially in Africa, you know, whereby, you know, we know that mm, maybe that was not a very, very sound, you know, decision to make, you know. And then everybody looks at each other and says, well, no, we're not going to tell them that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're not going to tell them, them, them right. Yeah. So, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, I, I think we are built to follow because it's simpler to follow and we, we don't like the responsibility of being the one to make the decision because we are afraid of the outcome. And in, in Africa it's much more because of cultural background, because of how we were raised, because of the social constructs of authority, the patriarchal culture, um, and even so, in some cases, even the mitratical culture in, in, in some places where we say now, no, the mother has spoken. <laughs> you know, the mother has spoken. You know, that's authority. And we carry that to work. We carry that to school. Can you describe the significance and implications of the Pentecostal Christianity movement in Nigeria and particularly the role of women in this movement? Look, the, Pente the rise of the Pentecostal church is, uh, I've sort of tried to study it, it's, I, I find it very fascinating that it's very much linked, and it's everywhere in Africa by the way, it's very much linked to the socio-economic development or decline of most societies, you know, um, the failure of government, you know, um, the, the rising hopelessness that we find in most societies, you know, that had so much promise. You know, for, for us in Nigeria, for instance, it was the, the broken promise of the oil boom, 
where we expected that our lives would change, you know, and after the Civil War, for instance, and there's this era of peace and prosperity, and I remember that I was born in an era when it was one naira to one pound. I've tried to, like, link it to the decline of that socio-economic um, circumstances of people when they feel that there's nothing, there's no, nothing to hope for anymore but to look at the divine. And, and then you see it in South Africa, right? You see, you see it a lot in South Africa. The more load shedding, <laughs> the more night vigils <laughs> that we have, you know, kind of thing. You know, no, nobody wants to sit in the dark on their own and, you know, and ponder their lives. Let, let's all go to church and do some clapping and things like that. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm being very simplistic about it. But the reality of the matter is that I've noticed that religion, religiosity increases when there is less reason in reality, in our reality, to be hopeful. So in terms of the Pentecostal churches, I wouldn't single them out, you know, I think just looking at organized religions generally, and then the role of women in that space. For some reason, women, women give their life to Christ before men, <laughs> you know. Uh, Women, women tend to be a bit more pious, right? Um, women is the backbone of any society and any organized space. And I think most of the time we, we keep ignoring them at our peril as men, you know. Um, and when even they don't recognize their power in that space, it can be very dangerous, you know, at the end of the day. Because uh, that woman, she has a lot of power. <laughs> And she wields it the most when you ignore it. Thank you very much, Femi. Thank you for having me. Great. That was Femi Coyote discussing his novel, Gaslight. <laughs>